Hey, everybody, welcome back to, to Thinking Outside the Long Box. As always, for this special interview episode, you are listening to Gabe, and you are probably watching him on YouTube as well. And today, we are going to be talking to Ben Rock. Now, Ben, uh, you guys may remember us talking about him a little bit when we discussed the movie Alien Raiders on the show. And uh, he actually hit us up on Twitter when he saw we were talking about his uh, his movie. And now we are having a conversation with the director himself. Ben, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. I uh, I, I, I have one eye on my, uh, my son who is sleeping right now. He's two and a half years old. Oh, so man. I, I kind of have an eye on the... Uh, on the old baby monitor and nice. for those of you on youtube welcome to my messy office <laughs> right you know the, all the bangs and thumps in the background that we've gotten so used to because we're in covid like i have three kids in the house two dogs four cats oh, man. like it's it's chaos it sounds like somebody's moving bodies around in my house constantly <laughs> so, <laughs> so obviously i am going to be uh I am going to be derelict in my duties if we don't immediately bring up Alien Raiders. Uh, so we discussed Alien Raiders as what we call a pop culture classic. And it was picked by uh, one of the co-hosts, Doyle. And Doyle is kind of known for like intentionally making us watch either terrible movies or like things that were kind of like sleepers for him that look like they're going to be awful, but end up being really great. And Alien Raiders is kind of, not kind of, is in the second category. It's one of those. It's one of those movies that I think of as like this is way better than it has any right to be. Oh, thank you. So, tell me a little bit about you know how you got started on the project, like you know, kind of the genesis of it and how it came to be. Well, it was the brainchild of uh, Dan Myrick, who is one of the two uh, directors of the Blair Witch Project, and I've known Dan since college. And um, it was part of a. of a slate being made for a company called Raw Feed. And Raw Feed had done three movies a few years earlier. So we, we shot Alien Raiders in 2007. And I think it was like 2005, they had done three movies. So there were three principal people in Raw Feed. Dan was one of them, Tony Krantz was one of them, and a guy named John Scheiben was one of them. Uh, John had made the movie that was kind of the breakout hit of those three, it was called Rest Stop. And it made enough money uh, on the DVD market, which is like a funny thing to think that you could do that today, but um, it's, <laughs> right. not even, it's not even that much later, but DVD market is, yeah. And, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, Rest Stop had been kind of a big hit. And so Warner Brothers, who was basically financing everything Raw Feed made and was using Raw Feed as kind of its direct genre arm, um, ordered three more movies. And so uh, the only director who returned was Tony Krantz of those three principals. I thought Dan was going to direct this movie when it was called Supermarket. Um, And then I got a call literally six weeks before the shoot had to happen that uh, he was looking for another director. Now I had talked to him before that and I had kind of made an impassioned pitch to him about like why I thought I would be a a, a viable choice uh, to direct the movie. So I I had known maybe a couple of months before that, that uh, it was at least looking like he wasn't going to direct it. And then, uh, again, it was like late September uh, in 2007 with a, an early December, December 2nd uh, shoot date. And it, it could not be moved because they were, Raw Feed was, again, making three movies in a row. So they were making a movie called Otis that Tony Kranz directed. Then Rest Stop, Don't Look Back, the sequel to Rest Stop, right. uh, which Sean Papazian directed. And then the third and final one was Alien Raiders. Again, at that time, it was called Supermarket. And Dan uh, reached out to me. It, it was so long ago that he reached out to me on AOL Instant Messenger to see if I would do it. And, <laughs> and uh, I was like, are you fucking with me? Because uh, I really wanted to do it. I was excited about it. Um, and so I was brought on. And right around that time, um, David Simpkins, who wrote it, Uh, was sort of delivering his last draft and he was about or his wife had just given birth to twins I want to say right then and so he was like I'm done like you know and I know that (laughs) because again I have a two and a half year old I know that like when you have brand new babies in the house the idea of writing is not easy even though I I did it but uh, that's another story um so uh, so when the script was given to me and, and I was brought on board in late September of 2007, at the same time, uh, uh, Julia Fair was brought on to rewrite it. 
And we all knew uh, that we were kind of like bearing down on a brick wall because there was a Writers Guild strike that everyone knew was gonna happen. And it was starting in about two to three weeks from that time. So uh, the script that David gave us was, he actually gave us two different scripts. The aliens were different in both. Um, and and uh, one of them had what I thought was the coolest part of it, which was kind of the test scene that reminded me of John Carpenter's The Thing or not, it's not one scene, but the testing protocol that they do. Right. And, uh, and <laughs> to me, that brutal, was like- Brutal, brutal testing. <laughs> to me, that was like the most fun part of it. And, uh, and you know, I'm a giant fan of the thing. So to, to make something that I could sort of steer into being, you know, homage-ish to the thing, I, again, given that I had a really short period of time to do that, um, because uh, not to get too in the weeds of the way the union stuff works, but basically the Writers Guild strike started the week that we started shooting, I think. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It started like three weeks before we started shooting, like I said, because I think uh, we had Julia for two or three weeks of my six weeks of prep. And, uh, and in that time, uh, the script David had written was just on our budget, not uh, entirely feasible. It was nonstop carnage and action. And, and it, had a, it had probably a third more characters than we had. And uh, we were working with a relatively low budget. It sounds like a lot, but it's not because because uh, the way Raw Feed was doing everything is it all had to be shot in L.A. So that mean that tr that means you're every union. That's like Writers Guild. I had to join the Directors Guild. Uh, obviously, SAG, the Screen Actors Guild. Then you've got IATSE. So like every crew member is union. Every uh, even the uh, Teamsters, everything, right. the whole the whole shebang. And because it's in L.A., like it's also top dollar even for those unions. Right. Um, so the budget was two and a quarter million, which sounded then and now like quite a lot of money. Um, but uh, we had to shoot the whole thing in 15 days, which is, you know. Absurd. Yeah. yeah like, I, don't know if, I don't know if you know Joe Lynch, uh, but, uh, you know, Joe, Joe talks about making Mayhem and uh, Everly. And I think he made them in like Serbia or Bosnia or something like Eastern Europe somewhere. And he said that the producers basically came to him and said, well, you can make this in LA, but you're going to have to do it in like three weeks or we can go to, you know, wherever it was in Eastern Europe and we can have like eight weeks. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Cause you know, just the, the foreign exchange rate, blah, 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 all those things make a big difference. And so the fact that we had to make it in LA, I think made that budget, it, it just intensely shrinks the budget. Um, and all of the raw feed movies were made in 15 days. So that was, wow. that was kind of part of their thing. And um, we all kind of shared the, I won't say the majority of the crew. Well, it probably was the majority of the crew. So it was the same art department, production designer, um, makeup department, all of those people. And they could hire different people. So the only people that I was really able to bring on of my own were um, the director of photography and the first AD. And then they hired their own team. So, you know, grips and electrics and stuff. So, uh, but because it was a strike, um, we were able to get pretty amazing people. So the director of photography was Walt Lloyd, who shot like, I mean, if you look him up on IMDb, he's shot everything, but he shot uh, some very noteworthy things he shot were like sex lies and videotape for uh, right. and <laughs> shortcuts for Robert Altman. And he brought Robert Altman's son, Bobby Altman, on to be uh, a camera operator. So like, you know, yeah. that that was how we got a lot of those people. And, you know, Carlos Bernard, who was our lead actor, he was the main bad guy that's that season on 24. He had been right. like the, he had been sort of the second guy below Jack Bauer on 24 every season up until then. And then he turns bad <laughs> the year before. And Carlos's last day on 24 was literally our first day of shooting. So we shot one day without Carlos. Then we had him for the other 14 days. Um, so the strike in a way kind of worked, worked in our favor. Although, you know, there, there are so many random stories about things that out of completely out of our control. Like for instance, our payroll company was Axiom and they went bankrupt and <laughs> all the checks bounced. And I had, I had been able to save some money in production that I was expecting to use for visual effects and do more CGI than we did. I, I, it was never going to be a heavily CGI movie, but there was a little bit more planned. Right. <laughs> And uh, because of the Axiom thing, we just couldn't afford to do it um, because literally everybody's paycheck bounced. And Axiom was the second largest uh, payroll company in California. So it's like shit that's just totally out of anyone's control. You know, like it, it was not a controversial move right. um, for our producer <laughs> to use them. And then, you know, so we had a strike on one end and then we had, you know, a 
a bankruptcy of our payroll company on the that it had nothing to do with our company even it's you know they just but so um weird. yeah yeah but in that <laughs> in that weird void in the middle we actually got to make you know we had a lot of fun making it it was you know 15 pretty intense days um but because it all takes place at night in a grocery store and the whole thing we shot all of it at, at an actual closed grocery store a vons that was in uh um in in uh uh blanking oh in inglewood sorry so it was on the corner of crenshaw boulevard and imperial highway not very far from lax actually uh standing in for rural arizona um <laughs> uh because we shot it there uh when you're in the grocery store you can't tell if it's day or night um, oh, so right we, so we shot what you call splits which means it, it, it was the best it's the best possible way to shoot our call times were usually like 10 or 11 in the morning and then we would shoot till midnight or so and then everyone would go home so you weren't like murdering people by making them shoot all night and you weren't you know make, murdering people on the other end by making them be there at five in the morning right which you know most shoots if it's a day shoot your call time is dawn so whatever right whatever to catch is. the light or whatever <laughs> and then if you want if you want to eat breakfast on the crew you know you show up a half hour earlier so like i've i i did a project a few years ago where i was the second unit director and we, and we shot like almost the whole thing uh well like a lot of it was outside and so our call times were like five o'clock in the morning so you'd have to be there at four thirty if you wanted breakfast uh, that's awful. <laughs> and yeah, of course, I would want breakfast. <laughs> so oh, oh, well, you do. one of the things that I loved, it, and this is like just a little dumb thing that was in Alien Raiders. So there's there's not a ton of shots like of the grocery store proper. Like a lot of it is angled like towards like the produce section. Mm -hmm. But there are like a couple shots where it pans past the end caps of the grocery store shelves. And like <laughs> in one scene, it kind of pans past these boxes of cereal. And they're like a fake brand of cereal. Yeah. And then the next in cap is like a name brand product. And then the next thing you see is like the produce section. And in the produce section, there's like a, a tub for like, you know, an energy drink, like a brand new yeah. energy Nas, drink. Nas energy drink. It made me it made me laugh so much because it was like, you know, clearly there was some funding there, you know, to get the product placement and stuff, but, but it, it smacked so much of like amazing B movie that there was like fake cereal, <laughs> real cereal, like, or dish detergent or something. It, it just gave me a really good chuckle, you know, <laughs> when <laughs> I guess like there, there is a question wrapped up in there Ball when good. you, when you're, when you're doing things like that, obviously, you know, you kind of have to cater a little bit to people that are like giving the, the film money, but what does it take to make like a shelf of fake boxes of cereal? <laughs> well, you'd have to ask our production designer, Frank Bollinger that, but uh, I mean, we had a lot of, I, so interestingly enough, there was originally a storyline that uh, my producer beat out of me that was in there, which was one of the one of the shoppers who gets evacuated at the beginning is a little girl, mm -hmm. and uh, she turns out to be infected. And so there was like a like kind of a coda at the end where uh, where uh, Courtney Ford and um, Matthew St. Patrick were to show up with with uh, Carlos Bernard's knife and just imply that they were going to murder a kid not show it just like you know sort of like it's it's about to continue into the next thing and this got written out early but you know again i only had six weeks so early is like you know a month a month from now you're shooting <laughs> right um, and and so uh if you want to make sure if you're making a movie and you want to make sure that no one will do product placement in your movie at all nobody <laughs> imply that a, a child is about to be murdered at any yeah. point <laughs> and by the way, you know, when it comes to product placement in something like this, it's like nobody wants to see, you know, uh, their product bludgeoning someone to death, for instance, you know. Right. So uh, and, and really, I don't think that we were getting money like budget money in ex uh, for the product placement. I just think we were getting product to fill the store because that was probably I hate to think how much of our budget probably went to just that. Just to so, fake store. <laughs> yeah, because what we were shooting in was a Avon's, which is like a giant grocery store. Right. right? and it was closed and uh i wanted it to look small town and there was actually a um there was a grocery store that we had scouted in carson california which is excuse me which is you know it's like a smaller town not too like right outside of la and it looked great it was old timing we kind of stole the look of our store from there from the store that we had looked at um 
but it was supposed to be small town Arizona where you wouldn't have this massive, massive, massive supermarket. And so uh, we built a wall that uh, kind of took a third of the store away from us. So it was oh, about two, two cool. thirds the original size, but there was the shelves were there. The checkout lines were there. There was nothing on the shelves. Hmm. And this was a cause of much debate in pre-production. Um, and what ended up being a lot of what was in the store, I mean, like uh, there were some liquor companies and booze companies that gave us product placement. So when the shoot was over, uh, those areas got raided immediately by the crew, like <laughs> emptied out. Um, but like, you know, and if, and if you really were to do like a map of the store, you'd be like, I don't think a grocery store of this size would have that many aisles of, you know, snack chips. Right. <laughs> um, you know, uh, and some of it are props, you know, like the meat and some of the fruit were props. Some of the fruit were real. Um, but like the ones that would spoil immediately, like bananas were all props. Um, the, the meat hanging in the refrigerator, those are, you know, like you can just rent that stuff. Right. Um, but, uh, but as far as the brand name stuff, the, you know, like I wish I could say it was like intentional to be witty, like what you're describing on, on my part, but it was like, we had to fill this giant <laughs> fucking building and it really was big. And, uh, and a lot of the way they did it was they went to like, I guess the dollar store companies have a clearance store. So everything's like 33 cents or something ridiculous. Right. And they just cleared out some of those things. Our, our producer had, uh, had wanted us to try to like go to a real grocery store with a DSLR and just take high res still images of stuff on shelves, print it out on cardboard and put it on the shelf. And the problem is like, it just looked like there has no dimension. Yeah. yeah. Some of that, some stuff like that. I mean, I don't, he wasn't demanding that we do it that way. He was, we were all trying to figure out ways to just do this cheaper. And um, some stuff in the freezer aisle was done that way because you've got, you know, the freezers got, got that. It's frosting. ghosted with the ice. Yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> also you know, something I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> if you look carefully. Well, and we had talked about shooting in a real grocery store. And in fact, that one in Carson, we could have shot there. The problem was uh, they were open. So right. we would have had to have cleared our entire shoot out every night at the end of the night and loaded in every day, which on a 15 day schedule, just add too much. to yeah, take two hours out of your day every day just for loaded and, and, and tear down, uh, even if they change their hours. And then also kind of go like, oh, well, on the freezer aisle, you'll have to either live with shitty sound or turn the freezers off whenever you're rolling. Right. So that kind of necessitated going to an empty store, right. um, which, you know, I mean, we, again, very quickly went through all of our options. Do we, do we build a fake store? Is it all a set? Do we, you know, and, and I always, I was always uh, on, on the team of let's, let's, find an empty store or find a closed store i think i i learned a lot of my uh how to do it on the cheap uh in my life uh when i when i started out in the business i was a makeup artist and i worked on a bunch of movies for david a Pryor, and right. that's what that's what david would do you know he basically had all of mobile alabama in his pocket and he could and he would find an empty bar and and, and uh you know just turn on the lights and you know, you got almost everything you need there. So, you know, that was sort of my thinking from the beginning, but you know, I, nice. it, it, it was quite, a, it was quite a conundrum because I, again, I, I hesitate to think how much of our budget just went to that alone. <laughs> so one, you know, in the past, one of the projects that you, that you worked on was uh, the Blair Witch Project. You know, you, you did some production work on it and then you also uh, did, like some of the directing for the for the documentaries that were like on tv and stuff like mm -hmm. that so Blair Witch is probably one of like the first movies that I ever saw that kind of blurred that like reality you know fiction line like going into the theater I had no clue that this was like a produced movie until the credits rolled and nice. then I was like oh holy shit like that was all fake and it freaked me <laughs> the hell out you know but it would freak me out to watch something like that not knowing that it was not knowing, <laughs> you know, so this no. is like this is a totally different time, you know, it's pre internet, all of that stuff, you know. Well, not quite pre internet, but like, like very internet early internet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, working on something like that, working with prior, you know, you've done work with Stuart Gordon, like, there's a lot of things that 
you have had to, you know, basically figure it out because they're like, you know, budgetless ideas and like movies, but they end up being great still. Like Blair Witch Project, massive success. Like Alien, Alien Raiders, super, super fun movie to watch. Oh, like so like much. I said, like way better I can't believe, than- you know, we're 13 or 12 years after the movie was finished and people are still watching it. Blows my oh, mind. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and Blair Witch even more so. Like that movie is, you know, decades old and is- I mean, it's burned into people's brains. Like they're still making sequels and reboots of it. Like it's, you know, it's crazy. Like when you look back on your career, like, do you feel like there's a certain kind of like director or person that you need to be to, you know, hone in and create good things with very little? Well, um, a lot of my background, uh, in addition to like working on those David Pryor movies, uh, like my whole life I've worked in theater and that's actually where I work with Stuart Gordon. Uh, I worked on two plays with Stuart out here. Um, and, uh, you know, he's, he's, you know, he was, he was just an inspiration and, you know, one of my heroes and they say, you know, don't meet your heroes, you know, but I, he, he was the best. Nice. Um, Stuart was a wonderful guy. Uh, I'm still super sad that we lost him and even sadder that we, we didn't lose him from COVID, but we lost him during COVID. So there's still been no memorial service or funeral, but like right. all, you know, all the people who knew him and worked with him, which is a massive number of people, you know, uh, we're, we're all just devastated by his loss. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, doing a lot of low budget theater, you, you just have to figure out how to, how to come up with a quick, dirty, stupid way to do anything you're doing. <laughs> And um, like I said, I, I started out as a makeup artist and I did, you know, monster makeup and stuff like that, uh, sometimes for, for David Pryor. And, um, you know, it's just a matter of like knowing what the camera is going to see, knowing, knowing know what you can get away with is, is, is the, the thing. And uh, I, I recently saw a thing with Ron Howard where he was talking about how, you know, the first lesson he learned, I think from Roger Corman was like, all you have to care about is what's in that frame everything else doesn't matter. So, you know, figuring out how to, how to, how to do that stuff, but you know, it, it becomes, I wish I had a, a more pithy answer for you, but <laughs> I, I feel like it just kind of becomes kind of hardwired into your thinking. Like I, I don't think in techno cranes. Um, I keep thinking the next time I get a movie, I should just make sure to have a techno crane if I can afford it. So I can start thinking in like techno cranes. I've used steady cams and stuff like that. But I think that uh, I have, I have an affinity for kind of the down and dirty, um, way of doing it with a smaller crew and and uh and to me that it's it's more fun and alien raiders was weird for me because it was a pretty big crew but if once you came to the set it wasn't that it wasn't like a massive unwieldy titanic that you couldn't turn around right (laughs) Uh, sometimes you know like you'd realize sometimes like you know you'd say i would say like okay we need to get this close-up of blah 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 and then 45 minutes would go by once the machine started rolling on getting this insert and and it's like learning how to say to them, like, no, 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 we don't need to light up everything for a mile in that direction. It's just a close up of this. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, you know, but um, that's more, I just think, like the big, not, it's not big studio because Alien Raiders was by no means a big studio film, but it, it's a bigger thing. Like, I, I do a web series with my friend Bob DeRosa called 20 Seconds to Live. And most of our crews, when we would do it, would be under five people. And so you could, you could move really fast. But also, you know, you don't have certain niceties to that. And our goal with 20 Seconds to Live was always to make it feel bigger budget. But it was, you know, teeny tiny crews. Um, and uh, I don't know, to me, that, to me, that's more enticing. And there are big, big directors like Paul Greengrass, who, uh, you know, when you read about how they make their movies, like, yeah, he'll have the full crew. But then, you know, he's in, you know, Tangiers in the marketplace and he can only have himself and a camera guy. And you're like, right. yeah, that's 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 how you get the noise away from the signal, you know. So my next question has to be about 20 seconds to live. So there's nine episodes of it. I literally just watched them all. 13. There's 13 oh, there's 13. Episodes. So the playlist I saw only had nine. So I'll have to I have four yeah. more to watch. <laughs> but yeah. uh, so. For for viewers and listeners that haven't seen these, uh, why don't you describe them to us quickly, and then like talk to talk to us a little bit about like the how the concept came to be because this is this is some really good stuff. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, no, I, it's it's definitely a labor of love for all of us involved. So, Twenty Seconds to Live is it's a horror comedy web series, 
and uh, every episode, it's an anthology. So every episode is all new characters, although there is one character that carries over into a second episode. Um, but it's, it's all new characters every episode. You kind of set up a, a premise and then at a certain point, the title card 20 seconds to live comes up onto the, onto the screen and then the 20 drops down and becomes a countdown. And one of the characters you've met is gonna die in the next 20 seconds. And, uh, and we realized when we started doing it that it's kind of a game with the audience. Like, you know, the, what makes it fun is to set it up so that you either strongly think it's gonna be one person who dies or you have no idea who's gonna die or you don't want anyone to die or you, you just can't fathom how they're gonna die. And my guess is if you saw nine, you probably saw all of, ep- all of season one. Um, right. And so season two, uh, we raised a little bit of money for it because the first season literally came out of our pockets. And even though we did fewer episodes, we got better production value, or I shouldn't say better. I think the production value is about the same, but we focused on having more exciting stuff. We had a special effects makeup company that did some, some kick-ass makeup effects for us, a company called Autonomous. And um, you know, we were able to do a little bit more ambitious stuff in the second season. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, to me, that's the fun of it. Hopefully one day we'll get to make a third season. But you know, right now, I've, I'm, I, again, I have a two-year-old, so it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to have a hobby horse. Right I, have, I have been there, I assure you, <laughs> several times. So my, probably my favorite one is the one with the paramedics, when like everybody oh, thanks. dies. Clear, yeah, yeah. I, I died laughing. I was laughing oh, so cool. hard that my son came in to my office and was like, what are you watching? And I <laughs> made him watch it with me. And oh, then we cool. both died laughing. Like this is, <laughs> it's such a good idea to make these like super shorts that like tell a story. And it's exactly, it's exactly like you said, it's a game where you're like, oh, pretty sure that person's going to die. No. Nope. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> like that's, and it does it really quickly. Like, how do you focus a story down so much like that? Because I know like that, you know, there's an idea in like fiction writing of like flash fiction where it's like literally a couple hundred words or less, you know, and these are kind of like flash fiction videos. Like how did you get to where you were nailing it down so tight? Well, Bob and I, um, uh, I I promise to answer this question. Bob and I uh, had been doing, uh, we're members of a theater company out in LA. uh, Well, actually, I'm not a member there anymore, but uh, called uh, Sacred Fools. And they have a show called Serial Killers. And Serial Killers is like a late night comedy show that they only, you only do, you know, like uh, it's it's episodic. So uh, you would bring a show there and they had to be a max of 10 minutes. If they go over, you lose votes. But anyway, the audience votes to bring back episodes. Oh, and cool. we did all kinds of gross out gore, blood and stuff like that. We, we, we really enjoyed doing that. And uh, we'd been kicking around the idea of doing a web series, um, partly because it was like, we're putting all that work into a theater thing, which is going to be watched by, you know, best case scenario, maybe, you know, 50, 60 drunken people, maybe, maybe 100 drunk people on a, late on a Saturday night. And it's fun and it's good practice and all that stuff. And actually, a lot of the actors in 20 Seconds to Live are people we knew from doing serial killers. But, um, you know, we wanted to figure out how to do something more permanent. And then both of us had worked on a web series for our friend Courtney Rackley. She did a web series called Firsts. And I directed two of them. And Bob wrote one, but not I didn't direct the one he wrote. And um, it, was, it was a really good experience because it was like super minimalistic filmmaking. Uh, it was exactly the same as this, you know, like a, shooting on a DSLR with a tiny crew and, you know, just kind of run, not, not run and gun, but like, you know, make it look good. But how little, how little and minimalistic uh, can you make something and make it look good? And Courtney was having some issues um, because her original leading man, I think he was moving out of town or something like that. And so she had to like change because it, it was a, a continuous story of, of these characters. And, uh, and Bob and I were kind of kicking around ideas and I said, we should do something that's an anthology so that we never have to worry about mm. like bringing the same people back. And in fact, more than once we had somebody drop out like a day before because they booked a commercial or something and we had to replace people at the last minute. But it's, it's an anthology and none of these characters recur. It doesn't, doesn't fucking matter. Um, so as far as the conciseness of it, that was sort of hardwired into the idea for both of us from the very beginning. Um, and the reason is like, I think when people are watching stuff on the internet, they would rather watch something, the shorter, the better, like, you know, it's really hard to get people to watch something. It's an hour long, unless it's, 
you know, if, if you're un unboxing Disney toys mysteriously, you can get people to watch stuff forever. <laughs> right. But uh, but if but if you're making a movie, if you're making like a little short film, I even know my own my own uh, attention span starts to drift. If someone's like, "Hey, watch my short. It's 15 minutes long." I'm like, "This better be a good 15 minutes." But like, <laughs> you know, so like our longest episode by far is the one with the magician, and I think it's like three minutes and 20 Something seconds. Something like that. Yeah. Called Heartless. Our shortest episode is the one that you're talking about, um, Clear, which is a minute and a half. Yeah, it's 90 and, seconds. It's yeah, amazing. It's <laughs> super fast. And so, uh, I mean, I think a lot of the credit has to go to Bob in terms of like setting up, like how to, setting up a concept, a premise very quickly. And a lot of times it's sort of like shorthanding a genre. So like in Clear, we're basing it obviously on like every medical TV series you've ever seen where you've got a couple right. of paramedics going in and there's already a you know a, a crisis in, in in progress and they you know they have to do whatever they're going to do like every episode also did kind of skew different genre wise a little bit which is part of the fun of it i think too for us because we get to play you know like when we did um when we did the one with the magician our dp george foyt was like all these have been realistic like can you can you really do that i'm like we can do anything we fucking want like it, it doesn't matter you know and one of the ones in in season two that you haven't seen uh which is one one of the only two that i personally wrote uh, has a time travel aspect so and it's straight oh, up nice. sci-fi um so you know and i thought it'd be funny to do time travel in the middle of a thing that is about a countdown clock and just have the countdown <laughs> clock freeze but um <laughs> that's awesome but um Anyway, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, the idea was always get to the point, almost start in the middle of a, of, a, of a bigger story. You know, you could you could see almost any episode as like, you know, you, you're in a longer story, but we're just starting at one at the point where it starts getting interesting and we're stopping right after somebody dies. You know, and our first episode um, anniversary to me is, is, is kind of the that was the template. That was actually, I think, the second or third one we shot, but it was like, Oh yeah, I think we get exactly what this is. Like the first one we shot was Climax, which <laughs> is um, funny too. That stars Courtney Rackley from First. Yeah, so, yeah. No, they're they're a blast to do, and we got to work with some really cool horror people like Derek Mears is in Astaroth, and uh, Tom Holland, the director of Child's Play, is in Evil Doll, <laughs> yeah, um, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was just great to meet him because he's one of my heroes, and he gets hit by a car. <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> it was funny asking him to, it was like a hot day and i was like uh, let me feel the pavement make sure it's not too hot for you to lay down he's like i'm gonna lay down on that ground i don't care and he just did <laughs> that's awesome he was so, so cool so i'm probably gonna butt up against like the end of the interview pretty quick i i probably could ask you about a million more things but the thing that i i want to ask kind of like it, you know as we get towards the end is you, you have a podcast that's on Shutter that is kind of a cool concept because it's like video, but it's like a looping video over the podcast uh, called Video Palace. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I thought was really interesting is that you've actually brought in people in the podcast that are like actual people that work for like Dread Central and that sell videotapes yeah. and things like that. Um, that's what I do for a living. I'm a VHS seller. Uh, so, oh, so you probably know Eric. Yeah, like when I heard him talking, I was like, oh, that's crazy weird. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so when when you're like kind of pitching that, like how is it that you end up getting on like a video streaming service with like an audio podcast? Well, it was made as an audio podcast and actually they added the video stuff. That was footage of Sam Zimmerman like loading VHS tapes that was made for their TV series, The Core. Mm -hmm. And I think that because they didn't have a podcast specific tab on uh, on the streaming app on your phone or on the TV, they just wanted to put some video on it. So I can't take literally any credit for that for the video stuff that's on it. It's just kind of weird and looping and doesn't really have it, it, it does it's not part of our story. It was something that Shutter wanted to do. So you know that's cool. Um, uh, but in terms of like how it came about, uh, Mike Manello, who is another one of the principals from the Blair Witch Project, um, uh, he was the co-producer. And uh, Mike was the guy who had the, he doesn't get enough credit for this. He was the guy who had the thought, hey, what if we made a website? <laughs> so um, he, uh, he, he, had a, he had a strong marketing background and still does. He's, he's in New York and he runs a company called Campfire NYC. And uh, they do like really out of the box marketing campaigns for stuff. 
And I guess in pitching some ideas to Shutter for a marketing campaign, he got to know the executives. But separately from that, he and Nick Brachia, who also worked with him at the time, I don't think Nick works at Campfire anymore, but they're still good buddies. Uh, he and Nick had had this idea for Video Palace um, and he kind of ran it. They, they kind of wrote up like a five page pitch document and gave it to Shutter, and Shutter was way into it. Nice. And, um, uh, but, you know, they're running this giant ad, cam, ad, ad company and they don't really have time to do it. So Mike asked me if I'd be interested in writing and directing it. I, I said, uh, I would love to do it, firstly. Mike and I had been talking about making a horror fiction podcast just for fun for years. So it was like, you know, uh, it, we didn't, no, no one got paid handsomely on it, but it was like, hey, we don't have to put up our own money. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so, uh, so uh, Mike brought me on, and then I brought Bob DeRosa, the guy who I co-created uh, video, or uh, excuse me, Twenty Seconds to Live with. And Bob and I uh, wrote the script, sort of based on the on the pitch document. When we finished it, I kind of went back and looked at their pitch document, and I was shocked at how close we were to what they had initially pitched, because it was nice. sort of just like a blurb outline for each episode. There were several. I mean, obviously, a lot of new stuff came up as we were developing it, and some of the ideas that they had didn't quite work the way you know and so we'd had to change it but they knew everything that we were doing before we did it and uh when i mentioned earlier about writing something right after uh becoming a parent as david simpkins uh the guy who wrote alien raiders uh, did uh i was hired to, we, bob and i were hired to do it uh starting in early june of 2018 and my son had been born like three weeks earlier oh, <laughs> my, wow. only, my, only, <laughs> my only child and uh and and so uh, I, I, a sleepless ghoul that I was, um, I Bob and I kind of started uh, going through the script. But it was one of the fastest turnarounds on any project I've ever done. In other words, we were hired um, in early June, and the final thing was finished and delivered in like the at the very beginning of September. So uh -huh. it, it was kind of how we spent our summer vacation. I would say as far as projects that I've done, I don't know that I've ever done anything that came out exactly as close to how I imagined it as this did. Oh, like, that's cool. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, and it was fun because, you know, Mike Manello and I, we had been talking about how would you go about doing like a, a fiction podcast, like a horror podcast. We really love the idea of doing it. Um, and we had strong ideas about how to do it, but, you know, neither one of us had, had a specific track record in that world. So, uh, you know, it was, really amazing of shutter to take us even though we had a track record in in other things that would make us qualified to do this because it was in a way a little bit like blair which not not in terms of we left everybody in the woods for a week but um <laughs> but it, you know it, it had it had some overlap in that it's like a fake documentary it's a fake first person documentary podcast more like a serial or in the dark one of those kind of true crime podcasts and um and, but I wanted it to sound for all the world as much as it could like that. So I used a lot of the techniques that I had done, especially on like the Blair Witch documentaries, Curse of the Blair Witch, the Burkittsville Seven, Shadow of the Blair Witch, uh, where, where like- <laughs> Which anyone fetch who... a good price, just so you know. Sorry, what? Those tapes fetch a really good price. Oh, really? The Curse I have of the them. Blair Witch and stuff like that. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have them all on tape. Um, <laughs> so do uh, I. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, the, the technique is when you're doing an interview with someone, so like, for instance, the Jacob Manders character, um, I would give them uh, like a two or three page brief on everything that they're going to be interviewed about. But, it, but we would bring in actors, like in that case, Joel McCrary, who, I, who was in Alien Raiders. I've worked with Joel a bazillion times. Or Larry Cedar, who plays Randy Wayne. We give them kind of the freedom to kind of ad lib. It's not even ad libbing. Uh, ad libbing would be like, I give you a script and you kind of play with the script. This is, I'm giving you the information and you're telling me the information as yourself. Yeah. Uh, when you're, when you're interviewed. So, so it kind of means that it's going to change enough, but part of it for, uh, for video palace was, you know, like around, uh, say the eyeless man who, who's kind of a mysterious character at the center of the podcast. We wanted everyone's description of him to be a little different kind of, you know, Rashomon that stuff, which is exactly what we did with Blair Witch. Like mm -hmm. no one was given the same information. So the information is intentionally kind of all kind of poking. Like different diffused. Parts. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, you know, describing different parts of the elephant. Um, as far as the VHS culture goes, um, I am, I'm not super deep into the VHS culture, but I, I do have a little stash of VHS that I have kept over the years. <laughs> and I had watched a movie called, I think it's called Adjust Your Tracking. 
I forget what it's called. Uh, but I, I watched a movie uh, about kind of VHS collector culture and Eric Spudik actually had a, had a store like a short walk from where I'm recording right now um, oh, nice. called Spudik's <laughs> Movie Empire. So I've, I've known Eric when I, he was in that documentary and when I saw him pop up and talk about his stuff with uh, Tales of the Quad Dead Zone, I was like, I know it wasn't even just like, I know that guy, like we're friends on Facebook and, you know, every now and then we chat and, and um, you know, th- to me, that was a sneaky way to kind of give the whole thing credibility yeah. uh, was to bring people who I knew like Steve Barton from Dread Central and Adam Green, you know, the film, amazing filmmaker. You could make a whole series based on Adam Green's interview, by the way, he elaborated and, and, and embellished so much. It was fucking brilliant like that's that awesome guy, that guy is just he's just a, he's he's one of the good guys uh sam zimmerman obviously and uh, but bringing in eric and and brian collins too like th- those people to me just kind of sound th- th- you know they're going to intend they're automatically just going to sound like real people okay. that's that's how it goes yeah oh boy <laughs> she needs her water bottle <laughs> do it she this happens li- i have a giant sign that says live do not come in but i need water every single interview you gotta you gotta hydrate you yeah gotta you hydrate. gotta hydrate last we were talking to david ajala a couple weeks ago oh and wow. he's and he said hey here's a virtual high five <laughs> he goes catch the high five and she goes i can't catch anything and just like walks off <laughs> <laughs> oh man well i better wrap this up before zoom tells me that i can't record you anymore <laughs> oh man uh, if, if i would have known i could have said uh, I, I have the pro version of zoom, oh so. no it's it's totally fine it actually helps me keep focused <laughs> otherwise i That's would fine. talk to you for way too long uh so as as we're wrapping up uh let our listeners and viewers know how can they you know find what projects you're working on you know any of the any of the things that you know, you have about to come out, like any of that exciting stuff that, that, you know, people are finally starting to get back to now that, well, it's worse than it was back then, but now that people are pretending like it's not worse. (laughs) Well, I I think as far as production goes, people have figured out how sort of to do it safely or how to do it safer than they were doing it. So production has kind of started uh, ticking up. That being said, um, the biggest project I have going, I can't really talk about yet, but it will be another audio project. Nice. Um, not, not for Shutter. Um, although, uh, there was a spinoff book from Video Palace called Video Palace in Search of the Eyeless Man. Uh, the only credit I can take from it is I wrote one of the stories. It's sort of a, a collection of short stories from some amazing writers. Uh, one of the ones that makes me the most excited is John Skip. Oh, but, uh, um, yeah, that dude's Bree, awesome. He's awesome. He's a wonderful guy too. <laughs> Uh, Bria Grant uh, wrote one like there's there's some uh, Graham Skipper uh, wrote a specific story but also uh, was involved in the writing of sort of the framing uh, structure of it and Graham's oh, just cool. you know w- one of the best people alive um, so uh, anyway you can check that out um, the easiest place to find out what I'm up to is my website which is benrockonline.com uh, I, I would go into a long story about why I don't have benrock dot com but it, it, the short version is a boating company owns it and they won't let me have it uh, <laughs> but uh, like why don't you switch to ben rock online like i'm actually ben rock <laughs> the company was called ben rock all one word and then they got bought out in like 2002 and then that company got bought out like five or six years ago so if you go to benrock.com there's nothing there it's oh not- and so it's just like in in like limbo hell so yeah. there's no and- way to ever get it <laughs> And I keep reaching out to them and saying, like, you know, like, what can I do? Like, I promise that I will never sell a boat. I, I, I will never be a competition. But um, has hasn't worked yet. But um, anyway, yeah, go to BenRockOnline.com. Um, also, uh, I, I co-host a podcast called The Cinematography Podcast, where I talk to pretty amazing cinematographers. And uh, that's been ongoing for like seven years. Nice. So we, we have a deep back, back catalog, but we just recorded an interview with Anthony Dodd Mantle, who is one of my favorite DPs. And, uh, Very cool. and also we recently recorded an interview with, with Frederick Wiseman, who was my main inspiration on the Burkittsville seven, uh, with his amazing documentary, Titicut Follies. We just interviewed him a couple weeks ago. So, uh, I don't know when those are exactly going up. Uh, we had Shalotta Bruce Christensen who, uh, shot and directed the new, um, Hulu series, uh, Black Narcissus, um, Oh, I just I just saw a trailer for that last night. That looks really interesting. 
Yeah, we'd interviewed her before. She shot a lot of great stuff. Uh, she shot The Quiet Place, which uh, nice. in, in our initial interview, it hadn't come out yet, so I wasn't able to talk to her about it. But she shot like Girl on the Train and Fences. And, anyway, I can oh, go on and on about yeah, our, amazing, sounds... our amazing DP. But, but uh, yeah, check out the Cinematography Podcast. If you like cinematographers, we do kind of like this kind of, the style of interview you're doing where, you know, I, I get to fan out on all these amazing DPs whose work I like. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Hopefully I didn't fan out too much. <laughs> I tried to keep so, it as professional as possible, <laughs> but every once in a while I turned into Chris Farley going, you remember that time when you made that yeah. one movie? Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> I, 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 I do that too. I totally do that too. Oh um, man. No, I, I mean, just thank you for, uh, for checking out alien raiders you know it's it, it it was uh it it was a crazy experience and uh you know i'm just glad people enjoy it you know it was it was a lot of it was a lot of work but it was a lot of fun and you know for, for somebody who would like me who my entire life i'd wanted to make horror movies it was like one of the most singular thrills was getting to actually make one you know it, it was a blast to watch too like I, like i can tell you everybody on the show really enjoyed watching it like we all just had fun and in particular my wife when they went to cut uh the dude's finger off she's mm. just like oh shit like i mean <laughs> she like really like oh and that was awesome because i love that's that joel mccrary who, play, who plays jacob manders in, <laughs> right in <the> <laughs> Well, Ben, thank you so much again for being on the show, man. I, oh, I, my pleasure. I can't wait to catch up on uh, 20 Seconds to Live because clearly I haven't watched all of it. And I'm about two episodes into Video Palace and it already has me super intrigued. Oh, like, episode I'm, three is where it starts getting super weird. Nice. I'm a big fan of, like, I listen to, like, Tannis and a lot of stuff like that. I'm a huge oh, yeah, yeah. fan of horror fiction podcasts. So, man, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, no, no. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Of course. Um, really quick before I let you go, can I just get like an ad bump from you? Like, uh, sure. What do you need me to say? Um, you know, this is Ben Rock, you know, director, probably director of Alien Raiders since it's what we talked about, mm -hmm. uh, on the show. And, uh, you're listening to Thinking Outside the Long Box or you're watching Thinking Outside the Long Box. Either one works. Do you want me to do both? Um, sure. Yeah, that's no big deal. All right. Uh, this is Ben Rock, director of Alien Raiders, and you are listening to Thinking Outside the Long Box. Awesome. You and, and you want to do watching? Sure. This is Ben Rock, director of Alien Raiders, and you are watching Thinking Outside the Long Box. Thanks, man. I really appreciate your time, especially considering that it all happened because of Twitter. Your your movie's a blast, man. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, I'm I'm really excited about Video Palace. It scratches a lot of my my nerd itches. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I you know keep listening to. It. I mean, we never really go back to those initial. Um, Sorry, I, sh I stopped recording and I shouldn't have. Oh, that's okay. Um, we, we never go back to those initial uh, interviews with any of those people. But if it, also, if you're on Shutter, you can, uh, they have the extended interviews with each one of them. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I watch, like, I have two monitors and one of them is playing either like YouTube deep crawls or, <laughs> or like Shutter. So yeah. I'll, I'll be sure to check it out. Yeah, I mean, and I mean, I don't, I don't mean to shut down the discussion about the video that they put on it. It just wasn't it wasn't part oh like, no we, we delivered them an all audio project and then when i saw it on shutter i was like oh that's interesting i had no idea that they were going to do that that's that's kind of what i thought too is when i saw it i was like oh that's interesting and then it didn't tie into the story but it became like just kind of that like visual to remind you that it's still going kind of thing yeah i don't know it was an interesting idea i mean so. it doesn't bother me it's it's sam zimmerman you know he's a cool guy but uh right yeah i mean yeah uh, but yeah i mean it I would just say that the podcast was designed to just sort of be listened to. Um, yeah, but, and that's exactly yeah. what I've been doing. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's not like that distracts from it. But yeah, they have, um, when I was editing the, because uh, all the interviews and stuff, uh, I personally edited. And when I was, you know, like there's a montage, that montage that has all of the interviews in it in episode one, which is maybe four or five minutes max for the whole montage. Well, each one of those interviews was probably a half hour. Oh, nice. And, and so uh, I went to Shutter and I said, like, hey, would you guys like bonus extended interviews? Because like I, bef in order to edit those anyway, I had to cut the interviews down. Right. Um, and so I and it was specifically Adam's interview that I was just like, fuck, we got to use the, all of this. This is great. Like, <laughs> nice. A Adam's just so uh, Adam, Adam's just such a, a brilliant dude. And um, yeah. And I have actually, uh, I I've worked with him. He, he, uh, released 20 seconds to live. The first season is all released by Aeroscope. And then uh, I was an associate producer on Victor Crowley. So I actually got to work oh, on that nice. set 
and wonder like what will happen like how is how are we going to keep a lid on this because like adam didn't want it to ever be discussed until it got released and then i was at the arc light the night that he went out to speak in front of the audience and was like hey you know and everyone thought they were there to see a 10th anniversary uh screening of of the original hatchet when he told them that they were going to see a movie that no one knew existed and they had kept it under wraps all that time that's so awesome i fucking loved victor crowley too god like i watched it uh with with um when it when it premiered on last drive-in mm-hmm. and people were just freaking out about watching it again like it's such a cool movie i it's watched so that one with, i watched that one with my wife too and she's like i don't i've never seen anything like that this just like <laughs> straight hardcore gore and the funniest thing you've ever watched like <laughs> yeah I-